Hello, my name is Dean Controver. This is The Current Buzz. Thank you for watching today. Today we have a young lady. Uh, her name is Jane Sarantino. Sansonito. San Sansonito. Those Italian names, you know what I mean? Um, Sansonito. She's assistant professor at UMass Lowell in history, but I think your major is Roman and, and ancient Greek history? That's is right. It? I'm the new ancient historian. Oh, the ancient historian, the new one. Okay. Um, welcome uh, uh, to... Um, Greater Lowell, and I, I heard you, uh, you're a resident of Chelmsford, is that correct? Yep, that's absolutely right. I moved here last July. How do you like Chelmsford? I love it. I've been really enjoying, despite the pandemic and all the closures, there's so much green space here. So I've been out in the parks, I've been on the rail trail, and enjoying, especially with the turning of the seasons, all the ice cream. Oh, the ice cream, okay, from uh, Sully's, is that absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this question. Um, you, how, what got you involved in history? Why were you interested? Were you interested as a young girl in history uh, yeah. growing up? Or? Yeah, I was, I was actually much more of a fan of mythology and, and sort of ancient religion, and I was interested in the gods. My grandmother gave me a book when I was a young girl of the Greek myths beautifully illustrated. And so when I got to middle school, I started taking Latin. Uh, and really from there, just loving the language and loving mm -hmm. the culture, I decided I wanted to focus on it in my education at college and then beyond. With 12 gods. 12 gods. I'm going to tell you a story. I met a, 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 a husband and wife who um, were, lived on Mount Olympus nice. in Greece, and her house was 12-sided. <laughs> oh, excellent. And he was a, a believer in... I did see video uh, from Greek TV that... He, the home that I was at, he was showing it. Oh, and so there are still people who believe in the 12 gods. I've actually had a couple of students over the years who are actually still practicing pagans or neo-pagans. Well, I hate different... to use that word pagan, you know? It's definitely I something mean, the Christians imposed upon. I mean, but... uh, you know, they took my gods away. No, I mean, absolutely. You know. But traditional Greek and Roman faith is really complicated and really interesting. And I'm going to tell you another story. When I was in the third grade, I had an IQ test, right? And you have word association and... <laughs> I remember distinctly. Uh, they asked uh, Pluto. Well, there was Pluto the dog in the, in those days, and there was Pluto the planet. So I blurted out to the teacher. I said, uh, Pluto, uh, the uh, god of the underworld. They flipped out. They told my mother that you know I was a bright person, which is not true, <laughs> and because I said Pluto, yeah. the god of the underworld. Absolutely. You know, so it's uh, one of those things. Um, Zeus. You know, is my favorite uh, person. Hard, hard to go wrong there, there King of the go. Gods. So you got involved. So then you, then you decided to go to um, university, undergraduate. Yeah. yeah. So I was born and raised in New Jersey, and mm -hmm. my parents, bless them, uh, said, "We'll figure out how to make it happen wherever you can get into." And I went, "I'd like to apply to Oxford University in England," and they went, "Shoot for the moon." And we all, you know. It's never going to happen. Right. What a joke. But then I got in. And so we orchestrated. I lived for four years in England, uh, went to Corpus Christi College at Oxford University. Mm -hmm. And the way the English system works is unlike here at UML or somewhere else mm -hmm. where you study many subjects, you only study your field, your major. Wow, while that's you're there. interesting. So I was four years of Latin, Greek literature, Roman history, Greek history, Greek philosophy, Roman philosophy, and art and archaeology. What a place to study that. It was a fantastic experience. Right. And the beauty of the way the system there works is you're in your college within the university, so right. you're already in a smaller community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then within your field, there are only usually between four and eight people in every year. So you create a very small little mm -hmm. world and you work one-on-one -on -one with professors. L let me ask you this question in case there's people out there watching and, and their children may want to go to Oxford. Yeah. What should they do? And it, who pays for that? Do you, does it come out of your parents' pocket or, or yeah. do they pay 50% or the state? Of, yeah, so there's not... Um, <coughs> the, the real problem that we discovered <coughs> through this is that because of the way that the system works in the UK, you apply both to the university, so to Oxford or Cambridge mm. or Durham or wherever, right. and to the state. So you apply through what's called the UCAS system. And that's the whole university system for all of England because their education is so heavily subsidized. And as a foreigner, you don't get into that uh. pocket of money. And unfortunately, the way that the system works in the states, at least however many years ago it mm. was now, um, you are not eligible for federal student loans with 
a foreign education. So it came out of my parents, and we're still working our way oh, through that wow. privately. Wow. Um, so That's it, interesting. An expensive undertaking. I, I remember when we first met, uh, this was a few months ago, and I asked you to be on my show. And the first thing I asked you was, uh, have you ever been to the opium den? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> great, great little Chinese place. Yeah. It's a Chinese eatery in Oxford. It's called the Opium Den. It's not a Opium Den as people may perceive it. Yeah, no, but no, it was no just bad, funny. no bad intent. But it is a famous <laughs> little little hole in the wall place, and uh, we used to go for big dinners because they come out with big portions. Yeah, so that, that, that I just thought I'd bring that up in regards <laughs> to uh, Oxford. So you got educated at Oxford. Uh, you went to grad school. Yeah, right after that, um, I uh, had a year off just to catch my breath yeah. and also to pick up some modern languages, which is expected for most graduate degrees in classical studies, which is what I oh, was is that right? focused in. Yeah, so I picked up some German and a little bit of French and a little bit of Italian oh, okay. uh, at my local community college, and then I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Okay, for one year? Uh, no, for my, gra oh. for my graduate work. Oh, for graduate work, okay. Yeah. So that was six years. That was six years. Yeah. So you have a doctorate. I have my PhD. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. I should have put doctorate. No, on, it's quite all right. On, very good. So what happens after that? You go uh, to uh, you teach. Yeah. So I had some training as a teaching assistant in graduate school, and then I went on and became a postdoctoral fellow at Oberlin College in Ohio. Okay. So I was there for the last two years before applying and thankfully receiving uh, an acceptance to this job here in Lowell. Um, Oberlin College uh, is a famous college in Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any children that are interested or grandchildren that are interested in going to Oberlin, I think that you should look into it. It's well known throughout the country and out the world. Um, Oberlin uh, uh, accepted the first woman uh, to get her undergraduate degree, and they also accepted the first African American. Uh, in the United States. They're extremely proud of that history, yeah. rightly so, They're because they aware of that. accepted yeah. the first person regardless of race, which right. really took a progressive step that others then followed. Right, exactly. So I just wanted to bring that up yeah. so the, in regards to history. So uh, you taught at Oberlin, is that my understanding? Yeah, I taught for two years Two there. years, and, and, and what did you teach there? I taught a mix of things, Roman history, Greek history, uh, Greek and Latin language as well. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite course, and actually one that I'm bringing back to Lowell this fall, was Pirates of the Mediterranean. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, so teaching... May I sit in on that class? Absolutely. I mean, that More the merrier. I'm, I'm getting everybody into the pool. It's that's, good fun. That's interesting. So then, uh, uh, what happened? How did you apply for University of Mass? Was there somebody leaving or, or? Yeah, so my predecessor decided that he was going to take a different direction in his career, and they opened a broad search, so it got posted everywhere. And I understand it was, a, you know, as most jobs in, in academia generally right. are, a big pool. So it was a, I was very fortunate. Right. Uh, did you think the Oxford education helped uh, kick that in? Or, I think it never hurts general? because you... Through an Oxford education, you learn to speak one-on-one -on -one with people okay. who you know are smarter than you. Right. And I go into every conversation assuming whoever I'm speaking to is smarter right. than I am. Um, and it's, <laughs> I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I that's, think it's that's good my policy. Yeah. Um, and you know, sometimes you get proved wrong, but yeah. that benefit of the doubt helps. And I think it makes you open to new points of view to have. Even when I was younger, even physically stronger, I always you know, led to the person that was allegedly, for, uh, in, in their mind, physically strong. That's all right. Let, yeah. let people think what they will that's and make right. your own judgment after the fact. That's, that's very good. I like that. So you, you're teaching that uh, first year, right? Yeah, just finished uh, up. Just finished up. How did that go? It went really well. It was very interesting and challenging to be teaching exclusively online. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we've pulled some of the best elements of that experience, and mm. we're bringing them back to the classroom with us. So learning more, especially about how my students do their reading, mm -hmm. how they engage with reading has been something that this year was really hard to assess, mm -hmm. but we found new tools. And I think we're all gonna be very eager to be back in classrooms to oh, I agree. talk to one another and get discussion going. Mm -hmm. But we did projects like creating virtual exhibits online, and we did projects that involved editing Wikipedia. And so we've used some of the digital Oh, I have to talk to you about components. editing Wikipedia. I have something that I want to It's been an interesting yeah. year, but I think, you know, I'm right now supervising a master's student. I'm working with a number of undergrads one-on-one. -on -one. I'm expecting to have more of that when we get back in the fall. So mm -hmm. 
I've left this year very hopeful. Were you surprised in the large American Greek community uh, here in uh, the Merrimack Valley? Absolutely, and I've been very excited because I was told that down the line there's an interest in developing a Hellenic center at the University oh, of Lowell. And oh, there's wow. actually movement, and you know, hearing it here first, mm -hmm. um, that we may be setting up an archive to preserve the history of Hellenic Americans from the greater Lowell area. I see. So I we're see. very, I was very excited about it. It was news to me, but it also has made so much richer my experience with students saying, let's talk about Greece. Let's oh. dig into this. So mm -hmm. next year we're teaching Greek history, Hellenistic history. Wow. Like come in and sit down. Let's talk about these cities. Speaking about Hellenistic, the Greeks call themselves Hellenist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Greek is a Roman term, isn't it? Is it Essentially, is it yes. Yeah. So uh, there's a number of different names that come out of the classical Greek period for right. Greek people. Um, generally speaking, Helene is the one that comes out first, and that's mm -hmm. being related to Helen, as in Helen of Troy. Mm -hmm. But there are also Ionians and Dorians and Achaeans, all of which at different points in history refer to Greek people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Romans like Greek as their model, more or less. Right. I, 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 when, when I knew you were coming on the show, I got my, my old books out, you know, like, uh, I'll tell you, the, the Romans uh, by Barrow, the, uh, the Greeks by Kiddo, yeah. um, the Persian Expedition by Hexphon, Xenophon. Or, or, Xenophon, right? The Erring Life of Alexander the Great, the, the Peloponnesian Wars, and the Oh, histories. the histories by Herodotus, Herodotus, a favorite of mine. Now, did you have to read this in undergrad? I read it in undergrad, and I read more of it again in graduate school. I've read mm, most of that. This I would is, say this is the Bible, isn't it? It's a more fantastic starting place, and I love that. Relates to the Archaic mm -hmm. period, so mm -hmm. just before Athens is at its peak, mm -hmm. um, and it talks about the war with Persia. It really, really pushes Athens, doesn't it? It pushes Athens, and it's mm -hmm. interesting because Herodotus, the author, is actually from modern-day Turkey, He's from Asia Minor, mm -hmm. but he traveled throughout the Greek world and thought that the most important thing that had happened in all of history to that point was the rise of Greece and its taking its place on the center stage right. as a major power. Right. Um, but it's great. It has all kinds of wonderful stories about gold digging ants and people who are, you know, <laughs> prophesying. It's, it's fabulous. It's I think, I think underrated. You, I, think you, I think you should uh, reread it again if you forgot about it, uh, the histories. Uh, also, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey pulled that out again. Um, Always I'll, a pleasure. I'll tell you, it was, it's, it's the prose in, in the Iliad. Um, I, I, when I was living in Boston, I met this professor and his wife. I was at a restaurant with friends, and we were talking about ancient Greek history. And he knew the, uh, he memorized the Iliad. Back in the day, that was very common. I actually memorized the first 50 or 100 lines of the, right? of the Aeneid. Okay. Uh, so the, the Roman equivalent of that when I was in school. So I mentioned something to him about the Iliad that I knew, and it took him about two or three minutes, and he pulled it out. He had the and, quote. And he had the quote, and he read the quote to, I to me. I envy that. I mean, can you believe that? I mean, he eventually, about two years later, I saw an article in the Boston Globe. It was two years too late, but that, you know, he knew that, you yeah. know. No, it's, it's um, a fantastic... Memorization is very difficult. I think students these days instinctively reject it. Mm. But there is something a little bit magical about carrying a piece of the past with you. No, I, I agree. We should know the past. The other thing about, uh, have you ever been to Greece? Have I you have been to twice. Athens? Okay, twice. Okay, so you went to the Acropolis, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you go there and you see the building, it's 2,500 years old, and you come from a country that, what are, what are we, 243 years now? I mean, 2,500, and you look at this building and its columns, and you said, what the heck happened here? You know? It's, an, mean, it's an amazing, and I think for, for many people, especially of Greek descent, very moving thing to see. And of course, the, the Acropolis has been through, quite literally, the wars. I mean, they, they used the, the Parthenon as storage during uh, a number of wars for arms and it, battlements. It, it exploded it, at one point. <coughs> exactly. It was ammunition was put the in ammunition there. Ammunition was put yeah. in there. It blew up at one point, and this is seeing the survival against all odds, mm -hmm. and then also feeling a sort of kinship with, I, I love when you see 
a roof tile with a dog's paw print, or you see someone's chisel mark, like a human was here. Mm -hmm. Some very human experience took place here it, 2,000 it, years ago. It, the Parthenon was built on the Acropolis, which most cities in Greece or Asia Minor have Acropolis to protect the city. Yeah, the raised uh, fortress. A, a raised fortress, yeah, exactly. So what I found is looking out over Athens from the Acropolis was mind-blowing because they don't allow any buildings to be built over 10 stories high. To preserve Athens, that view. To preserve the view. Yeah. And it's very interesting because most cities, even Paris, has a modern uh, yeah. uh, building or, or Constantinople or Istanbul, as they call it now. Uh, you know, there's modern cities, uh, yeah. you know, uh, buildings going up, high rises. But they've kept that to a minimum. Yeah. I, I think that there's been a, a care taken to preserve what is the core of the ancient city mm. in, a, in a really respectful and powerful mm. way, in part because of tourism, but also in part, I think, because there's been efforts made by many Western nations to sort of downplay what the Greeks themselves achieved. Like, oh yes, I mean, it's part of the debate right now about the British Museum and the Parthenon marbles. Right, oh, is, don't get oh, me going on that. I, I don't right. intend to. All yeah. I mean to say is yeah. the, the rhetoric around it has been, oh, Greece doesn't take care of their past. And so I think Greece has been even more ambitious about building new museums, preserving that antiquity. Uh, the Elgin mob, Sir Elgin went to Greece and took off the, what do they call the paraffin, the, the top? Yeah, the, going around the outside yeah, of the I, full I, range of this, yeah, the freeze. Took, took the freeze and uh, took the statues and they're in the British Museum and you can see them today. Well, Greece has a new museum now which they could easily be put there, yes. but the British will not allow them Maybe I should get the uh, uh, British Council up here and ask her. It would be a very uh, interesting conversation. Him. Yes. <laughs> so um, let's talk about the big battles uh, that, that the Greeks perceive as a turning point. The Battle of Marathon, the Battle... Well, we won't even talk about the, the Battle of Thermopylae, my favorite battle, but Battle of Plataea. Mm -hmm. um, the argument in Greece is that if we didn't block Eastern or Persian influence coming that all of Europe would be Eastern. It's an interesting theory, and I don't know whether the counterfactual necessarily mm -hmm. helps, but I think there certainly was a turning point there in the way that both Greece saw itself, which I think has been essential, the idea that there is a, a firm Greek identity mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. built itself up more or less in opposition to Persia. Before that, Greece was a bunch of city-states right. that thought of each other as enemies. Right. After Persia, they think of themselves as a a unit mm -hmm. in both cultural and linguistic terms. Right. But I think it's also interesting because Persia was, and remained throughout the Greek period, the largest superpower in the world. This mm -hmm. massive empire spreading over all of Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And Greece was this little dot on the fringe of their world. They weren't really concerned about them. Mm -hmm. But after they failed the first time, they went, well, we can't, we can't allow the world to know that we we're defeated. We're defeated. We have to go back again. And Greece was ready, which was a really important turning point. And Persia, as a result, began to look more inward, decided that maybe Europe wasn't where it was at, started having some of their own internal problems. And eventually, Alexander the Great marches along and goes, hi, I've I been love waiting. I Alexander the Great. I've been yeah. waiting. Here yeah. I am. So it's an interesting moment because before that point, and really that first conflict with Persia was kind of an accident. They were surprised by their own success. Mm -hmm. And out of that success, they really rose to the occasion, which is a, a wonderful thing to see, adversity sparking some good. Um, I only have five minutes left, but um, I was at the Marathon and we were in the car and we were looking for the mound of the, of yeah. the 160 soldiers that were, yeah. that were killed. And we were driving them round and round and round circles. So we asked a, a, a Greek uh, a, a person, uh, where's the Battle of He's right there. It was a simple hill, probably two stories high. I mean, there was no... It's hard to see from the road. You, don't, you, don't, you aren't <laughs> yeah. paying attention to it from the road. Yeah, but it, I mean, we were going in circles looking for it. Where's this hill? You know, there was no documentation on <laughs> and it. And Greece is all hills. Yeah, exactly. So you're like, yeah, it could be any of these. Yeah. So the, uh, the other thing, why is the Battle of Thermopylae that happened over 2,500 years ago, it was a defeat Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the, the Greeks or the yeah. Spartans specifically, why, was, why is that a big thing? What, what, why is the lose, losers 
Sparta managed the propaganda machine. They absolutely. Oh, well, that's a good point. They I've absolutely heard that. no. The Spartans stood up and said, "We gave our lives. Don't don't forget about it. Don't you forget the we 300. were three hundred. Don't forget for the three hundred. The three hundred. Do you remember them? Oh. And actually, historians lately have been looking back on this battle, going, "The Spartans sent the most miserable token force. They sent their king, who was not like uh, Gerard Butler. He was in his sixties. Uh, old and had never won a battle oh, in his life. Oh, was he, was he, he, he was yeah. he was not a oh, okay. not a not a great oh, hero. Okay. And everyone's like, you know, there were a bunch of people from Thebes who were there. They That's get forgotten. Right. There were a whole bunch of slaves uh, there, who were brought. There were a lot of Thebes. I think there were a thousand Thebes yeah. that were at the battle. Yeah, who just yeah. Sh quietly forgotten. Yeah. Okay. The Spartans brought their slaves who fought and died with no recognition, and the whole thing would have been quietly forgotten about as. A delaying tactic right. to That's protect what Athens, was. Yeah. and basically just to allow the Athenians to evacuate. They didn't even save the city. The city was burned. Mm -hmm. But the Spartans kept insisting, remember us, remember us, remember us. And I think, you know, we're coming up on Memorial Day. Sometimes the narrative of remembering your fallen soldiers is in the abstract more powerful than even the specifics of remember an event. Remember the Alamo. Remember the yeah, Alamo. Right. Exactly mm -hmm. the same model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so... Uh, they were defeated. Let's put it that yeah. way. That was anything you want to talk about the Iliad or, or the Odyssey before we. Uh, uh... I I mean they're they are classics for a reason. They are a delight to teach. They're a delight to read. I now think... some people are against uh, uh, reading the Odyssey. I think uh, that the the debate is less over whether that should be read as in what order it should be read. Um, so well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Mm. Uh, when my daughter was in the English class, they were. They were they were going to read the Odyssey, okay. and I spoke up and said, why are you teaching the Odyssey when you haven't read the Iliad? Mm -hmm. Because it feeds into the Odyssey. Yeah. And what happened is my daughter came home and told me, why didn't you say that to the teacher? <laughs> Somewhere along the line, someone's parents told their child, oh. et cetera, and uh, I was the odd man out. But that's all right. I have to stand up for my Iliad. That's quite all right. Now, I mean, sequentially, the Iliad comes first. It gives you the story of the Trojan War. Next up is actually the Odyssey. But they were all part of what's known as the Homeric Cycle. There were a series of poems, many more mm -hmm. than just the Iliad and the Odyssey, mm -hmm. that told the whole narrative from Helen being kidnapped through to everybody getting home, including you know lesser lights, get, get Agamemnon home where he's going to die quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the pieces we have left, and they're incredibly precious to us. Right. Um, there is a Trojan. There's a, 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 there is Troy. It's in Asia Minor. Yeah, absolutely. If yeah. everybody wants to go and, and take a look, it's a, it's been a fantastic thing. It was discovered because of a crazy man with a lot of money in the 19th century. Uh, Heinrich Schliemann okay. uh, made his fortune, decided he believed the Iliad was gospel truth, and went out with a team of excavators and started digging holes until he found where he thought it would right. be. It, it's basically near the Bosphorus, yep. I mean, that, it's, which it's, controlled... It's, it's yeah. essentially where Homer said it was, mm -hmm. which, you know, everybody else thought he was joking. Yeah, uh, so if, if you have that in your library at home, because I know everyone has the Iliad, <laughs> they could probably, so you know... You can get a good translation online for free. I recommend the Chicago Homer if anyone's interested. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. the, the translation from the yeah, Chicago... Trans Homer. translation at the Chicago yeah, Homer. Because there is different translations. Many, many. many. Uh, I like the Chicago Homer because it gives you the Greek alongside it, so you can look up and down on uh, the lines and see... How do you like this... Tra oh, this is Herodotus. And, and yeah, so, but this uh, is Celine Court, the, her yeah. the Histories, which is excellent. Yeah, okay. I just... Uh, there's another book, The Histories, we talked about it um, right here. Um, the Histories, is, it's an interesting book. I'll probably start reading it again. Can't you go know, wrong. Can't go wrong. Um, and, and it's a different perspective from high school when you're reading, you know, at an older age. You, you comprehend things a little more, I no, think. No, I think that's very true, especially with the Iliad, because the Iliad concludes with... King Priam of Troy going to Achilles, the great warrior, and saying, please give me back the body of my son. And I think as an older person, that parental relationship means more. He, he's my hero, Achilles. He's a great, great yeah. dude, but yeah. uh, angry. Very angry. Well, yeah, for a lot of factors. Yeah. yeah. Getting sucked in and all that. Well, thank you for being here.